think they can even hear us now, which is crazy. Wow. This is pretty awesome. I don't we even... have it all set up. I got it's Jeff muted, so... Seven, <laughs> 705, and we're, we're like, rolling for our first... What? Is this year three? Time. This is year three. This is crazy. Um, hopefully everyone can hear us. Let us know in the comments. Uh, I always like yeah, to make sure that good. it's not just... Uh, Audio, visual... Uh, are we good? I hope so. We're fine. I'm all not right. worried. I'm not. I can hear myself, and I sound great. You, you sound, always great. sound great. You you have you a voice sound great. Radio. So not not so much. It's all the fine tuning. So we are getting some comments about the wife's a little upset because you're down here watching uh, fly tying on Valentine's Day. You know what? We uh we just figured everybody was gonna go out on the weekend, and um, this would be a perfect thing to do for your Valentine's is show her. Yeah. Or him, like how much you like to tie flies. So yeah. anyway, hint, hint, right? So <laughs> right. well, it sounds like everyone can hear us, which is fantastic. Just a note: you might see a little bit of delay. We're playing with a new camera app, um, so All excuse right. us if there's a bit of an audio delay or video delay. But anyways, it's good to be back. It's Happy back. Valentine's, it is good everyone. To be back. Um, yeah, we got all sorts of stuff going on. So we took a little bit longer to get these rolling this year well, but we've been busy but we wanted to Cuba. you know shave it down to the best right. we can we can kick out so i think that was the whole idea um pretty excited about our guest tonight who we've had before is jeff hubbard I, yes you all should know who jeff is um he looks really good in this shot oh, right look now really good. You <laughs> it's look so like professional with that it looks good yeah. i actually so. have a fishing tan <laughs> oh, you do. Yeah, you were just a down. A little wind burn, a little fishing tan. Yeah, yeah. you were down been in the Keys, right? Bit. Yeah, did a little fishing in the Keys and uh, been on the on the river quite a bit, too, enjoying the, the spring-like weather we had. It looks like after tomorrow it's going to change again. It sounds like tomorrow morning we're supposed to get some snow again. We really need some snow. Oh, yeah. The waters are back to low and clear, right? I don't yeah. know if for you on the Pier Marquette, right? Yeah, it's starting to drop. I mean, even yesterday, I was out Monday and Tuesday with a client, and I noticed it just, you know, you could see the watermark lines just within a day of it dropping sure. super fast, which that's what's going to happen the colder the nights get. We have no snowpack, so. Well, the, gr the ground never even really froze. No. Nope. Not up here mm -mm. anyway. No. Nope. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's got, it's got a good little color to it still, but it's definitely getting clear and low again. But hopefully we get some snow, because... I'm sure, as well as you know, fall wasn't easy. I saw that. Oh, yeah. Well, everybody sounds, says we sound good, and we did have one one customer says he was engaged last year, but she left him literally because he fly fished too much. Oh, no. You know what? It's probably a good Yeah, thing. that's a good choice. Um, yeah, yeah. For Go Blue 18. Don't worry. John, you can you spend, know, you can spend you. happy Valentine's with us. So. You can. Go Blue, Don't worry. Yeah, yeah you there can. you go. And you there know you what? Like, it's okay. Because if she really did love you that much, she would understand that you need to fish. <laughs> yep. Right? And, um, oh, Matt. Oh, yeah, now you sound nice. good. Do yeah. I sound better? You sound great. All right. Yeah. Well, I think before we get any further, we should all wish our significant others a happy Valentine's Day just to, you know, just Absolutely. to make happy things. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Annie. Valentine's I know you're watching Day, that. other. See? There you go. Yep. So That's now we're perfect. all good. <laughs> um <laughs> A few things before we get going. Uh, I, I wrote notes down. Things you should know about you probably saw in the promo and the intro. Fly Fishing Film Tour is coming back to Traverse City. We've heard some folks did not see it. Yes. Uh, but it, is. it will be here April 6th. We are, of course, bringing that in. And tickets are on sale at the City Opera House currently. Yep. Another cool thing, uh, Riversmith is letting me give away a Ooh. river quiver. Oh, wow. At the film tour, Liver. which that's is sweet. So that's the that's the rod, uh, the roof rack, roof rack rod carrier. Six, and six times. What's even cooler is I'm going to go down to the Grand Rapids show on March 15th and give one away there too. All right. Oh, so wow. I'm just making it rain with you with are. river quivers. So that's hope awesome. hope to see everyone there. Uh, if you're up at Traverse City, that's April 6th. Then Grand Rapids, March 15th. Uh, what else do we got going on? I know we have some social fly tying nights we do we still are doing live our social tying nights at the um silver spruce brewery over on 8th street here in town in traverse city so stop reload by. sessions and those are opposite wednesdays of our live sessions and you can find the dates on 
Instagram, Facebook, website, all the fun stuff. So everyone is welcome. Come hang out. Even if you're not tying, come hang out and it's just a fun thing. It's so. just nice to get, out, to get out, out, of out of the house in the winter, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, especially this winter because it feels like if I'm not fishing, there's nothing else to do. I, you know, what yeah. was it? Three or four years ago, I brought cross country skis. I've used them four times. Yeah. It's like, just terrible. Winter's been winter sports have been obsolete. This right. Year. This yeah. feels like an Indiana winter. Yeah. Up here, I mean, I've been joking terrible. that I used to drive down to get this kind of, you know, downstate to get this kind of weather. Mm-hmm. Like right. it's just right. gray and brown. But oh well. Um, anything else you want to hit on, Brian, before we get going? No, I think uh, I'm super excited to see what Jeff's going to tie tonight because, you know, Jeff and I are kind of cut from the same cloth when it comes to tying flies, and that is just nothing but practicality. And sorry to get rid of these readers. Um, and that is guide flies. So these are flies uh, typically that you can dye pretty quickly. You can fill up a box, um, and they're very, very effective. So... Um, I'm a big fan of guide flies. Yeah, sure. I am too. And a little note about Jeff, if you don't know him, uh, I think he's a, a staple in Western Michigan. He's been on a, a guide for 25 years now on the yeah, PM. Is that be, right? Let's be 26. Wow. wow. Yeah. It goes quick, doesn't it's it? 1998. Yeah, I'm getting old. I even have to put <laughs> readers on now to tie flies. It's okay. Oh, I know. It's okay. We'll, we no worries there. We have to there. do that. Well, yeah, I, I have them too. So, And do you just stick to the PM, And but you fish pretty much everything there, right? Yeah. You do the I Muskegon mean, a little bit? Home base is the PM, but I'll, yeah, I'll go down to the, the Muskegon white. like this fall. I went down to the Muskegon a couple times, and in the spring, sometimes I'll go to the white, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just, just to mix it up, but home base is pretty much the pure yeah. And you do salmon, steelhead, trout, the yep. whole deal? Yep, all year round. Um, do it all. The trout, the steelhead, the salmon season. Yeah, so. I've fished with Jeff, and, and I will say... Uh, He's a lot of fun to fish with, super relaxed, and knows the water, has a very soulful approach. So <laughs> if you guys soulful. are looking for a guide Something on like that. The, and he's extremely professional. Yeah. Um, but if you're looking for a good guide on the Pure Marquette, absolutely uh, book Jeff. Yeah. He's great. I remember the first time I saw Jeff is before I met him was Gadget Master. Yeah. Yeah. Is okay. that four or three? Do you remember? I think it was the quiz th- time. I think it's four. Yeah. I think yeah. it was Gadget Master for, for for all of you out there looking for for something to watch that's kind of fun that features Michigan rivers and the Midwest and swinging flies. That's worth looking up. I, I remember sending away for the DVD. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm sure you can find it, you know, online Probably somewhere. On YouTube but somewhere. It yeah. was fun to make, especially with Tom, which oh, is yeah. Brian and I's you know mutual buddy. Brian's known him yep. for years. And that's Tom. Tom's awesome. Awesome. We've yeah, always yeah. had good times on the water with them unfortunately that that fall actually reminded me of this fall yes as far as the fishing goes we had such low water and brutal conditions but shortly after tom left after making that video you know we finally did get a bunch of rain where this year it just seemed like it was a never-ending drought we had a small trickle of fish every so often yeah every little pump in the water just a little bit and then it felt like those fish got beat up on oh, <laughs> and then, yeah, for then sure. they didn't want to eat uh-huh. so it made it it made yeah. it for an interesting fall and quite a few skippers yeah we uh, saw that too in the big man i was gonna and ask you about that yeah because it so, seemed like the norm even on them skiing the few days i went down there it was a lot of smaller fish sure i don't know if you look at your angler great lakes anglers diary mm-hmm. so for everyone out there we use an app and uh, it's called the great lakes anglers diary and you record every fish that you catch and the length uh, the sex, whether yep. it's wild or hatchery, whether it was released or kept. And um, so um, in 2022, I had 171 steelhead with an average length. And this is from, I want to say, like October to December. And average length of like 26.2. Wow. This year it was like 71 fish, 72 fish. And my average length was 20.2. Jeez. So a big difference, you know, with the number of skippers yeah. that we saw and, and overall fish. Like I had guys, you know, Chris and Brian that have been fishing with me for the past 27 years. I think we figured it out. Um, every year we fish three days. They're, they're great anglers. And we caught one adult in three days. Yeah. You know, the rest were skippers, but in the numbers were down. Right. But it was, you know, that's yeah, tough. It seemed, seemed to be the norm everywhere. Yep. So hopefully state. we get some some water and things turn around yeah. and, and thank goodness that we were able to get that one 
this steelhead limit passed. I hope yeah. hopefully it makes a difference. Um, yeah, we I start think everybody needs to start, you know, really thinking in long term and protecting our wild fisheries, you know. And, the and wild fish need to be protected. And that's another thing. Spawn. 92% of the fish that I landed this, this fall were all wild fish. Wild fish. fish. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, that's something really to think, you mm-hmm. know, think hard, hard and long about. So, yeah. Should we uh, tie a fly? Back to fly tying. Just <laughs> get in. the just last get note before tie. we get too far down the rabbit hole. Uh, Jeff's thankfully going to tie two flies tonight. And we're going to take a quick break in the middle. In between flies. Um, yep. And we'll, I mean, it'll be easy. You can, you can stare at Brian or, or Jeff, but I got to switch out a battery. So just survey. Perfect. Nothing, so, All right. but uh, yeah, take her, Perfect. take her away, Jeff. Batteries All right. Or else. Well, the first fly I'm going to make is, I call it the miserable magnet. And I developed this fly oh, quite a number of years ago, probably 10, 12 years ago. And um, it's a, it's a winter fly for swinging. Um, I kind of based it off kind of looking somewhat like a goby with the, the sculpin type head and the black. You know, it's kind of slender in the rear and then it just, you know, has more bulk in the front like a goby pattern would be. But the biggest key, I think, with this fly is um, the flash that I add to it and having the blue um, in low light conditions like we see all winter long. And unfortunately, we don't haven't seen it much this year but a lot of the snow would you know you get that low light effect with you get a lot of snow on the ground and you know dreary days and i found this fly to be very effective and i think a lot of it just had to do with that the way that the i put the holographic flashaboo on here with the silver and then the blue um flash and then the holographic raspberry i guess you would call it or purple flash and uh yeah Basically, purple, you can't go wrong with purple and blue in the winter I for agree. swinging flies. Yeah, 100%. And, um, and I think this fly, I I mean, I know Brian and I have a mutual client that fishes it even on the Manistee, and it fishes well. And I think you guys have even caught fish in the spring with it, we like have. dropbacks and stuff. Yep. So no, it definitely is a good dropback fly as well. So it proven, proven pattern. Yeah, it's proven. It is. Yeah, I've done really well with it. And it's, like I said, I kind of came up with it. I tied it, and... You know, back when we actually had winter, you know, 10 odd years ago, it was a miserable day. It was like one of those days. And I've learned, like, I love to walk in and fish. Like, I mean, I still go fishing any chance I get. Well, the PM's I, a great river Yeah, for I that. love to walk and wade the PM. And, yeah. you know, plenty of people have probably seen me down there. And But I've learned that the nastier the weather, the less people there are. And the better shot I have of, you know swinging a fish up walking in so i came up with this it was like just a darn nasty day you know a weekday and i went walking in there was no tracks in the snow i had it all to myself and i think i hooked yeah hooked and landed two fish in the first two holes with this fly and i mean it was so cold and nasty like the second fish by the time i tailed it because i don't bring a net when i'm swinging i just you know try to tail them and yeah bring them to shore and then let them go and i mean my hands were so frozen i was like that was it and i went back to the car i mean instantly but yeah so i kind of came up with the miserable part because it just seemed like any you know miserable winter day or rainy day you know good steelhead weather perfect i mean that's how we see steelhead weather right if the suffrage factor is high Exactly. Right, you're going to catch fish. High potential. You have to suffer, <laughs> and, and usually the fish bite. All right. So, yeah, that's kind of how I came up with it, and it's a really simple fly. And, I mean, the cool thing about actually both these flies that I'm going to tie tonight, you know, you can be creative. You can change colors on it if you want, like color of the rabbit. You could do it in olive. You could do it in purple. Um, but, yeah, it's just a good low-light fly, nasty day. And I'm tying this on a shank. Um, it's just a 40 millimeter shank, but I'm still, you can see it's not a really, you know, super long fly. So it's, it's easy to cast. It's not going to, you know, be real hard to get off of the water. And the steps are pretty simple. So pretty much the material is black rabbit, like I said, and we're going to use some blue schlopplin. And then for the head, I just use black ice dub and then the body we use um, black UV chenille, which I really like because it has almost like a, a purple gray kind of hue to it. Yeah. So it catches the light too as it's fishing across. Is 
This is like an ASMR microphone, so we hear every little. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Right. I've had some comments over the years of like, wow, we can hear that just every like single wrap of thread. We were <laughs> popping kinda, popcorn. Yeah, it's kind of exactly. cool. It, it, you know, I'm surprised Storm didn't wake up thinking it was going to be something to eat. So well, I got to put my old man glasses on. It's okay. We all have to have those crutches. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is basically it's a shank fly, as you can see. And what I use for the trailer hook is you could use, this is just 50 pound braided line, or you could use Power Pro, or some people like to use wire too. Um, but like Brian and I were talking about earlier, um, I tie all my flies for my guide season. I rarely ever buy flies. So the fastest and simplest way is kind of what I like to do. So whatever I kind of have on hand, that's what I use, you know, whatever's at the house. So I just get a big strain of the 50 pound braid and then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take it and just make a an overhand knot in it. Not too close to the loop. So then when I cinch this down, it's going, it's not gonna slip as much. And you could put glue on it too, head cement. But the key is, is that's a smart move. I've definitely had a snag or something where I pull really hard and you know, gosh, it pulls the hook out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've I, had that. I come actually, back with just a shank. It's not ideal. So I've had it happen with wire. Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. kind of these wires. wires slip. Yeah. I mean, like you can't get a good grip on, on in the wire a lot. And I mm -hmm. kind of stopped using it because I had a couple times where that, that happened. I think one time I was just pulling on it. Yeah. I'm like, holy cow, I cinched that down really well. Then that shouldn't have done that, and I did. Well, you rarely use a f lose a fish when you, when you, you know, hook them on the swing. Right. right. You know, because you're right. using heavier gear. And I had one this fall, uh, and it was an amazing day. Thank goodness we had already landed a couple fish, three fish. And we hooked a nice big fish, which they were hard to come by, right? Yeah. Takes me into the backing, oh. and my loop on my running line broke oh, at the back no. and then it was a intermediate running line inner you know i'm using intermediate head right but so i can see it because it's still bright you mm -hmm. know and i'm trying to chase it down with my boat and and i just lose it in this log jam and i probably looked 15 minutes for that oh. line i looked even the next day because the water was so low and clear you know like where did that go well, just wanted to horrible. get my way yeah what a gut-wrenching right. feeling you're terrible. just like Oh, no. And, you know, luckily I had a client that was super cool about it and was like, yeah, well, you know, I got the jumps. I got, you know, yeah. everything out of it. And we already got a picture. Got so. the fun with it. But it was still, it was, I mean, it's one of those things you just wake up. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, when you have, especially since you tie your own flies, if you have something that fails, you just feel badly. Yeah. Because there's nobody on that boat that wants to catch a fish more than exactly. you do. Right. And yeah. I'm the same way. And uh, thank goodness we have understanding yeah. clients. Especially swinging. Like oh. sometimes I tell my clients I probably want that fish, you know, more than you did. <laughs> right. Because it's just, to me, a lot of times when I'm guiding, it's almost, and it's probably the same with you. It's like I'm fishing. Right. You I'm know, fishing. I watch every step, every cast. I'm, I'm watching and seeing what his fly is doing in the current. And it's kind of like myself out there, you right. know. Fishing vicariously through your clients. Yeah, through exactly. the client. Right. Yep. So, yeah, what I'm going to do is um, wrap the shank. I like to use, I use this probably for almost all my flies, especially like egg flies and streamers. Is a, I use a heavy 140 thread, denier mm -hmm. thread, um, because you really got to cinch stuff down, especially, you know, egg flies. And whenever you're working with rabbit, too, you want to do a few wraps because a lot of times you'll find with rabbit if you don't stitch it down tight enough and you don't have a good thread base it's going to want to tend to spin on you so i wrap it quite a bit let's get a good wrap just like so and then what i do to put the braid on is i'm just going to I'm going to basically measure it out about the length of the, the shank. So when it sets back, I don't want it super long. I just want it so it's a little bit longer than my rabbit strip. And that way the rabbit's not going to get coiled in it. Or sometimes if you have it too long, you'll find like when casting, um, the 
the actual shank will get caught up up yeah. into the the front of the fly, especially if you have stuff like this. Like if you got some type of dubbing on it, you know, it'll it'll actually catch it like so. So you don't want to have it super long. Oh, I got to pick it up. There we go. So, yeah. So I'll just kind of take this and I just come right up through the eye. Oh, you go through the eye, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I'll just kind of come up like that. You really don't want to lose fish. No. <laughs> yeah, boo. And then where I made that knot, I'm just going to cinch down. And you can even make more than one knot in here, you know, just to guarantee it even more. But I'm just going to cinch it super tight. Jeff, do you tie this without the hook on there and put the hook on after? Yeah, a lot of times. So you don't skewer yourself very often. No, exactly. <laughs> so that's basically what I did is I just folded it, went up through, folded this access, which I'll end up just cutting off. But yeah, and then I got the knot. And I'm just, you know, and at this point you could put, you know, glue on it, head cement. And make sure, too, when you're working with, like, you know, braid or, like, Power Pro, you want to have a scissors that will cut that. Don't be using your nice fly right. tying scissors to cut through that because it's going to dull them out. And um, it looks so like want, are those those are uh, the rounded point safety scissors. Is that right? Or Yeah. You yeah, know what works, like, too? Like you had the... in school. <laughs> yeah. But being left-handed, I always had to learn oh, how to do it with the no. right hand. You too? I'm yeah. left-handed as well. There's a lot of people in this industry in Michigan that are left-handed. It's crazy. It is crazy. So, yeah, so that's how I would have it. I got my loop. Here, I'll show you. Like, if you put the... I can probably tie this with it and not get poked. You oh, don't have no. to make a trip to the ER. That would be horrible. So this fly, I actually write, I'll run it with the hookup. Because it's not going to have weight on it. Sure. And in the winter, I kind of like, whoops, having that hook shank up because. Logs and. and yeah, whatnot. logs. And then, too, you get, sometimes you get those picky fish that kind of like to pluck, pluck, pluck. Yep. So that's how it would look. Perfect. That looks like great. That. And what pound braid are you using? It's 50. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll try to tie it. This is a hook I actually had in the place, so I would not be fishing this hook because it's got a little bend to it. But yeah, so just like that. And then next step is we're just going to put the rabbit tail on. And this is just a rabbit strip. It's not a cross cut, just a black rabbit. And then what I like to do here, the same thing. I don't want to tie it on, you know, past the hook, because then what's going to happen is you're going to get that, you know, could wrap around the braid or whatnot. So what I do is I'm going to measure it out. Same thing about the shank of the, the length of the shank of the hook. And then I just come back and I'm going to put just a, kind of spread it apart a little bit. Hopefully I don't get hooked. <laughs> we get the first aid kit out here. Yeah. Yeah, we can show we're people all how to them use now, anyways, right? Well, we're first aid certified. That's we'll right. Be, yeah. We'll first stop the bleeding CPI. for sure. You need a tourniquet, sir. We need sir. a tourniquet <laughs> and uh, and and some piece of cheesecloth or what kind of cloth was that? Like chamois cloth. Chamois cloth. Did you see that? Yeah, like, I, I like, remember that what? part. Yeah, I gotta find that. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, oh, well. basically, I'm making a bunch of wraps where I kind of spread it apart. I'll show you guys again. And then I'm just cinching it tight because I don't want that to spin. Sometimes if, like I said, if you don't have a lot of thread wrap on the shank or on a hook and you're tying rabbit to it, you'll notice like when you go to do those first wraps, it wants to just fall either, right. you know, away from you or towards you, a lot of times towards you. So that's pretty simple. And you can see I have it. So just that little bit of tip of the fiber is just kind of into the hook so it's not going to get into the way of the getting wrapped up into the hook 
And then what I'm going to do is take this, which I use this stuff for everything. I love the polar chenille. The polar all the chenille different is colors. so nice. It builds up enough body. It has, you know, a fine offering of colors. Mm-hmm. A fine offering. A fine I like that. offering. You like that? So I'll just take a, cut a little strip of it. And I'm just going to tie it in at the tip. Pretty easy peasy. And then I'm just going to work my thread about halfway onto the shank here. So I don't want to overcrowd everything and leave a little bit room for the end. And then I'm just going to take this and just kind of palmer it and wrap it, you know, wrap it towards the eye of the shank. And you can kind of fluff off all these little fibers with your fingers. So it's almost like hackle in a way. It is like hackle. It gives it a little bit of body. Right. right. Are you using an octopus hook for that? Yeah, so basically almost all of um, my stinger hooks is I use um, like a an owner's number two mm-hmm. or an octopus like a gami um this year i found with the uh the lower clear water i was having of you know on the pm especially because i mean by that time it's like a spring creek when the water right. gets super low and clear and we were getting a lot of deal swinging where we would have steelhead kind of pull it and you could tell it was a steel because it you know it was a pull it wasn't like like a trout will kind of pluck pluck where right. a steel head has you know it's putting pretty good tension on it and pulling on it and oh it was such a headache we had so many days where we'd get a lot of pulls but the fish weren't coming back to it and i think it a lot of it was one they would you know pull on it and then they would get to where it was too shallow and just you know go back to the deep or go back to the log that they were hiding under. And two, they were smaller fish like we talked about earlier. Right. So I actually started downsizing a lot of my flies and even putting, you know, like using a number four. I did that. You know, I, type of stinger. I hook. switched over to full fours this fall mm-hmm. for my swing flies. Um, and I definitely downsized my flies and I made them more natural. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big you know. key. A lot of olive, a lot, a lot of natural of stuff. And you'll see like the next fly that I'm going to make t- tonight is um, a perfect low water natural kind of fly it just it just works it's great so yeah i'm just gonna tie that off and then all i do is i kind of take these fibers and evenly just try to pull them to each side and then i'm just going to take this rabbit strip so i'm basically giving this fly a little mohawk i'm just going to bring it back over and just separate it and let it kind of fall back so it'll give that movement, that rabbit will really move a lot in the current. And same thing, just quite a number of wraps and just kind of, you know, cinch it down, pull it tight. And that's it. Well, that looks good. Yeah. And I, simple, I, I, mean. I probably missed it, Jeff. Is that standard or magnum rabbit? Oh, I'm sorry. It's standard. Okay. Just standard. I wasn't sure. It, it, my guess is it's probably from hairline because it yeah. looked quite full. Yep. So I couldn't tell if it was magnum or, or yeah. regular there. Yep, it is hairline too. Dude, you're such a fly tying geek. You Nerd. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> uh, so then the next step... Is adding the sparkle. <laughs> so the first thing that I use for the base layer. Is okay, Feenstra. Holo- uh. Holographic silver. <laughs> and I don't want a lot. Maybe about a, a matchstick size. Because that's the thing, too. Sometimes on the PM, you don't really need a ton of flash. Right. You know, sometimes. You can always cut it off. Exactly. I do that quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a, a good thing to bring up because I always carry, like, a scissors in my boat bag. Yes. 
I do the same thing. Like I'll even if I have like if it might feel like my tail's too long. Yeah, or anything. exactly. Absolutely. I'll trim it, or I'll trim more. I'll trim you know, I don't need this much out. flash. Or, right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a handy thing to do. I do the know? same thing with my dry flies in the summer, and mm-hmm. you know, it's it's nice to be able to to know when you need to alter your flies. So yeah, I'll just take about width of maybe a match. Yeah. And I just put it on. Looks to be about fifteen, maybe twenty. <laughs> yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, no more than 18, right? You don't want to have more than 18 strands in that clump. Bad luck. <laughs> it is bad luck. <laughs> and then after that, we're going to add the electric blue electric flash. Electric blue. Everybody big fan. Do the electric, big fan of the electric blue. Electric slide. <laughs> Matt, I think you were the king of the electric slide. Mm, I don't remember that. No? Maybe the a wedding? <laughs> maybe the I wedding was. crashers? I think that was like the electric slide. Maybe at Joe's wedding. Maybe at Joe's wedding. <laughs> no, I didn't get invited. <laughs> <laughs> I had to leave early anyways. <laughs> I Just got to like sit so. next to a bunch of my high school teachers. Nice. It was great. So, And if you wanted to add more, basically all you do then is you would just take this. Ooh, that looks her back, nice. And tie her down. We'll put some more on. We'll just double it up. Double or nothing, right? That's right. This is the hard one to get. The cranberry. Yeah, the, oh, the don't. Holograph. Uh, I know. Don't is it raspberry it or is it cranberry? That's not cranberry. Oh, no, that's it's ra- ra- that it's like is, a raspberry. That's raspberry. Well, we have a we have people that are looking for cranberry. It's really difficult to we, get. So we now have we know. It. We I have know we do have it, but holographic. it's only in holographic. You can't get it in regular. You can't get it in regular. Just, it's just you darker know. than the raspberry. Right. Now who's the nerd? I'm just saying. You clarified it. <laughs> So this one I don't go too crazy on, but I do think this is. I think that one, that color definitely makes a difference in this. Yeah, fly. it just kind of. It's super the light. easy to use. Never sticks together. Yeah, look at it. It's all. <laughs> Jeez, have that sitting in the Brand dashboard new. of your truck, or. Just bought it. The teal does that as well. Yeah, the teal does that. I don't know why. Maddening. So I won't double this up. I'm just gonna put a little bit of it. Just like so. And just make sure you get this, when you're tying this, you want to get it wrapped pretty good. So you don't want this stuff pulling out either. So that's basically it. A good flashaboo wing. Then for the collar, what I like to do is this blue schloppen. But I want to find something that Like, even marabou would work good for this if you really wanted to bulk it up more. But I just find a real webby feather that's pretty long. And then what I'm going to do is just kind of palmer it back. And I'm going to tie it in from the tip. And I want basically the glossy side up when I tie it in because I'm palmering it forward. Well, that's like a good you, point. Yeah, if you look at a feather, a lot of times you're going to have kind of a shiny, the top of it, and then the bottom of it's a little duller. So you want to just tie it in from the tip. And then what I'm going to do is just take it, just palmer it forward and kind of just work it with your fingers. You can just work that so it falls back. So I'm not going on top of it. I'm just kind of working it forward. 
Every that time I great. turn it. Yeah, I mean, you can make this a fly right here. You know, it's kind of more of a Western kind of look, just with the collar on it. Just like that. Kind of has that spake kind of look. Everyone loves blue. I just think it's super, super traditional. Looks awesome. Yeah, I think in the past we've done the Heckler, yes. which is blue and black. And we and did the Blue one. Moon. You could find a lot of those even on my website with the recipes. And we did one that was, it had, it was kind of natural and olive as well with some orange in it. I remember that. Yeah, yeah the orange. The Pugsley. 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 The one with the rubber. Rubber yes. legs. Yeah. If That's people, like if people did want to check your website out, what would that, where would they go, Jeff? It's OutfittersNorth.com. Perfect. Yep. I know you have a fly box section mm -hmm. there with a bunch of patterns, a bunch of recipes, all that fun yeah, stuff. Yeah, you guys so. should check out Jeff's website. It's really nice. And I'm adding more stuff to it even this winter. When we had that cold spell, I took some time and actually, you know, like I said, I tie a lot of flies pretty much all winter for my season. I started tying all these flies, and I'm like, well, I should you know, start writing some recipes down. And so we're doing some more stuff on the website soon, too. So. And soon to be Great. YouTube. Soon I to be heard. YouTube. Yeah, we're trying to build up a... I had a YouTube page for a while, but I kind of, you know, just stopped putting stuff. But we're kind of bringing that back, too, and we're going to do an Outfitters North YouTube page and um, doing some fly tying stuff and some tips, tactics. I mean, just, you know, with fishing and plus gear, you know, what do we? What do I like yeah. to use, you know? I think there's some a the huge secrets. need for more info about... I mean, I know you do a ton more than swing, but that's kind of a, a niche you found yourself in. And I, I see so many people coming in that they've read something from the West Coast and they're they're buying a West Coast setup. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You, mm -hmm. you need a different deal for for our rivers, for our setup. It's a different deal. So it's going to be I'm excited to have that as a resource, even for myself and and for our customers. too. Absolutely. So that's cool. Yeah. I mean. Even here, like, I get a lot of questions, you know, on what, what size sink tip do I like to use? Right. Which, like, on the Rogue, you could fish a lot lighter sink tip, you know. You could fish, like, a T11 or even a poly leader in circumstances. Right. But, like, for the PM, um, if any of, if anyone has fished it, they know that it's it. a lot of the runs are shallow and they just drop right into a bucket. So I always tell a lot of people, like, my recommendation for the Pure Marquette is always, I always use T14, and I always have like an 8-foot length, a 10-foot length, and a 12-foot length of it. And that should cover all the bases. You know, right. like if the water's super low, just that little 8-foot is all you need, probably an unweighted fly at that point. Um, and then the 10-foot is probably, I would say, probably 70, 80% of the time is what I use, the 10-foot T14. I would agree with that. Yeah. And then if it's a little bit higher and dirtier, I'll run a 12 foot. Mm -hmm. um, are you running intermediate? Um, um, I I usually do like in the winter months, but with the water being so low, I've probably been using the floating more. Skagit heads mm -hmm. more like all season right now. Um, yeah, like the intermediate kind of, to me, when the current's, when the flow is fast, it, it works good because it slows the speed of the fly down. And that's really, you know, that's a big key to swinging flies is you want to, yeah, you want to slow that fly down. So it sits in, you know, the zone of that fish a lot longer so they can key in on it. And um, we just really haven't had any current like that this year. I would agree. Same with the big man I've seen yeah. the same, same things. And honestly, I like, probably fishing the floating head better too just because you can manipulate it more and mend it you know you can see it mm -hmm. being manipulated yeah. whereas yep. with the intermediate it's down there and you can't really do much with it once right. you know you it's like the george foreman girl you set it and forget it like, cat, <laughs> exactly cast, and there you go yep. like, you can't really mend it a ton to slow it down right so yeah yep. and that's and, a big key with swinging flies especially in the winter too i mean you know, a lot of the water you want to fish is kind of a walking speed type water. And now with the water being so low, an intermediate fly, there's just no current. The fly is just sitting there just right. kind of dangling and hardly moving. So, yeah. 
you know, there's actually a lot of situations this fall where um, instead of mending upstream, we would mend it downstream to get to speed out of the fly. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes yeah. they actually like that. Like yeah. if water temps and they're, you know, you're finding some bright fish, I would think, especially like on the bigger rivers, when you get down low and stuff and you, you know, you might hit or push a bright fish. Right. You know, a lot of times when those fish are coming in, they're moving those bright fish, you know, they're not hanging out in one spot for too long. They might pause here, pause there, right. and they're pretty active and they're pretty aggressive. So they like that fly. You're hitting I them think, in those transitional spots. Right, when right. it's sped up a little bit, you yep. know, it yep. just draws them, draws their attention a little bit more. We just had a really cool comment um, from Tim Scott, and he was saying that uh, he likes to tie them with a braid but then coating the braid with a UV resin to stiffen it a little bit to make sure even oh, yeah. in like, you know, like what we experienced mm-hmm. this fall with low water where sometimes that hook might dangle, you know, so it keeps it in the, so. Yeah, keeps yeah. it up. You can even do tubing I've done before where you can put a piece of. I've done the tubing as like well. Like tube right here. That's starting yep. to get pretty popular. Yeah. 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 It's I'll a smart way to do it. Yeah. Like even in my box, I'll have some, you know, cut up tubes and that I'll just slide it. That you can just it. add to it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, especially if I'm fishing like over wood, you know. Ooh, I like that. Like a lot of the, I kind of base my my flies, and the reason too why I don't add a lot of weight to my stuff is, you know, at one point I used to tie, you know, lead eyes or bead chain eyes on everything, and then like the scenario like this fall, you're like, oh, that was great. Right. I just tied all these flies, and they're all heavily weighted, and now I got to oh, fish no. all this low water. So a lot of times what I do is... um. And this is kind of a West Coast trick. Um, Tom Larimer used to do it all the time. Put a cone on Yeah, the I just put bullet weights yep. yeah. in front of my leader. And, you know, just it makes kind of, casting if I need great. to get down. Yeah, yeah. I don't use too heavy. <laughs> Probably the, the, the 30 second. 30 second. Yeah. Is yep. pretty, that's all you really need. Yeah. Um, well, I tell, I mean, well. I had this conversation with someone today. Sink tips are, you know, they need space to work. Concentrated weight sometimes is all is more important to be as you can get down right away right so yeah yep. and that's kind of how the pm is i mean like i said it's a lot of shallow fast mm-hmm. oh there's a bucket and Buckets. you know you got to get that fly so when it hits the bank or gets into that current seam you know you want it to drop quickly so it's in their zone because you know you might have a, a a run like the size of this table that's it that's you it know? it's got to get down quick in front of them where that's completely different than like you were talking about, Matt, with like the West Coast. You know, those guys will have, you know, pretty much the same length of the oh, yeah. sink tip on yep. and the same fly for you know multiple days of fishing. They don't <laughs> right. need to change Just it because believe. all those runs are so gradual. Yeah, they're not like big deep troughs. Well, they and... also have steelhead there and not lake run rainbows. <laughs> oh jeez, <laughs> no, we don't need to go into that argument. Wow, <laughs> I had to go. I there. would say oh. they're steelhead, and they. F- <laughs> I fought them there, and I fight them here, and they I don't fight any different. In fact, sometimes you I know, think the PM fish, I mean, you've hooked them. They're yeah. They got a lot of giddy up to them, yeah. especially they, being wild. Everyone yeah. I've heard that from has never fished here. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we we did ask that question so. to Larimer, who, you know, he was a guide forever in, in, in Oregon, and he's like, anybody that wants to challenge that, you take a, a West Coast fish and tie it to a Great Lakes fish, and the Great Lakes fish is going to drag them around. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it, it is true. I mean, no disrespect to the, the West Coast, but, man, I, ha- I hate them when they're all hating on us. <laughs> right? Because, you know, I mean, right. I get the fact that these, you know, have only been here since 1896. So right. It's not they're, long they're enough, Brian. Not long enough. It's like, yeah. it's like, let's see, I've lived in Traverse City almost 30 years. I'm still not native. Not a local. You're not, not native. A local. You're not a local. Not a local. No. Uh, to bring it back, we did just get a good question from Sam uh, about those bullet weights. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you find it affects the action of the fly at all, really? No. Okay. Mm-mm. If anything, it actually, when it, like, hits the water, it'll give it that little, like, kickback kind of thing, you know, where it wants to... Yeah. Flutter a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you fish them a lot, like if you're going to have one on, you know, like an all day kind of thing, sometimes too, you might want to put just a small bead. Yep. Yep. Yes. Below it. So it slides onto the bead and then to your knot. So it's, you know, you're not hitting your knot. Protects it. The lead weight constantly. Yep. But um, yeah, it works fine. I've never really had an issue with it. And like this fly is actually on my website talking now about 
you know, fishing flies for different water depth. So on my website, this was kind of the first version of it, and you can see it's just tied with a possum head, the head of it. You know, it's we put that right possum. up, uh, right up against the other fly yeah. you're tying, like and I'll this. I'll, yep. like, I'll put it on the on the close up can. Go. There you go. Okay. So you can see the difference. Yeah. So this I would fish this fly a lot. You know, when I want to kind of stay above woody debris, or if I know that particular hole has a snag in it, you know, because swinging flies isn't just what I do. I do a lot of indicator fishing too. Yeah. So I kind of, you know, over the years you get an idea of where the snags are and where they're not. But two swinging flies, it allows me to swing a lot of, I can swing a lot of holes that a lot of people can't fish with an indicator or a chuck and duck rig. Right. Because they are staying above. So I learned to kind of, I'll change flies a lot, really more based on where I'm fishing. You know, like if the current's faster, then I add the bullet weight. If I'm fishing more tail outs or the water's shallower like it was this fall, then I'm fishing a lot more stuff like this that has the possum. And I might still add this tiny bullet weight, but still that possum's going to keep it, you know, buoyant enough where it's going to keep it off the bottom and off the debris. Yeah. We had a really good question here, and that is, are you still tying a loop knot with the bullet weight? Or do you no, tie like a... I'm oh. I'm old school. I'm, so do you tie a loop knot? At all? No, I don't tie loop knots for my swing flies. For I, trout, I do. What? But I, just, I, I, I don't have a way. lot of faith. I don't, <laughs> I'm in the same I'm way. A, improve clinch. Yeah, or, I don't tie a loop knot either. Yeah. I catch plenty of fish without it. Yeah, I don't. You can't catch fish with them. That's not You know possible. what? The funny thing is my guide in Cuba was like, Brian, you know, I was tying my own knots, and I don't have confidence in my loop knot. They tie the perfection loop so fast. They do the perfection. You know, yep. And there are fish coming, and he's like, switch up your stuff. And... And he's not going to switch it up, so I switch it up, and I, I, you know, tied like my uni knot. That's all I use. Right. And uh, the he, I catch a fish, right? And he goes to land it, and he goes, "Never, Brian, let me show you this. Never see this. You never ever tie a knot that goes right to the hook. We need that action, otherwise the fish don't eat it. I'm like, you're taking the fish off, dude. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> the fish is in your hand." I mean, I get the fact that right. you do get maybe a little bit more movement, but I don't, I don't know. Confidence man. is it's king. It's confidence, man. Confidence yeah. is king. I've and always, like I said, for trout, I will, you know, yep. to get the little more action. I will but you're moving too, and you're not fishing, you know, on the bottom as much. And that's the thing too, like. And you're not that, hooking a 20-pound fish. Right. And with 15 that 15-pound fish. That loop knot, the thing that always goes in the back of my head too is on the PM. I mean, let's face it. There's a lot of hooks in the bottom of that river, and there's a lot of mono. And you don't know. Like, you could have that fish on, and it could get close to the bottom, and that, you know, that tiny little loop could latch onto a hook just dangling. And, I mean, I rescued a brown trout probably two weeks ago. I had a guide trip, and we were eating lunch. And I heard this, like, you know, we were on the right side of the river, and the pool was on our left, and we're eating lunch, and I hear this splash, splash. And I'm like, what in the world? And I look over and I see this limb going. And sure enough, this poor brown trout, you know, there was mono hanging down with a little nymph. And it took the nymph and, it, you know, the mono was stuck to the tree. And uh, we, you know, went over there and, you know, pulled a bunch of mono out. So that's right. the thing. I don't, it's all that kind of stuff goes through your head, when, especially swinging flies, because it's not easy to begin with. Right. You know, just like we talked about earlier, you know, we, just all those little things could come into effect where you might lose that one fish or, you know, a couple fish of the day. Right. And then it really affects You have to have 100% day. confidence. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm fu it's funny that you don't tie a loop knot either. Yeah. So I can't believe I even said that on... on we went over and rescued that brown yes. trout, and it was like a 15-inch brown. I mean, it was a good <laughs> thing we were there because I don't think that thing would have lasted, you know. No. How much good around. karma, how yeah, much good karma did you get too, from that? Because two pools later we caught a steelhead that's what i told the guy I'm like that was karma that was karma you exactly. know i rescued a duck uh, a couple years ago actually with tom baird uh, <laughs> who's an nrc guy we yep. were, were out fishing and this poor duck you know somebody had lost like had cast lost their little atoms uh -huh. was hanging off of a tree branch and this little duckling i mean it was just above the water level right so this baby duckling is is, is snagged on it like in its beak and the mom cool. is freaking out, and you know, she's, you know, got 15 little kids right. to buy her, you know, and, and we go over and release this, like, 
it was in a strong current. We release this thing and send this poor baby duck off into the corner. And uh, hopefully there's some, hopefully it made it and yeah. good karma after that. But it, it is, it's rough when you see something like that. I hate to see mm-hmm. that. Like some animal suffering because we lost it or right. you want to tie good knots, man. Yep. We really do care about these, these fish and, and all the animals that we work oh, with. Oh yeah. Right. I you mean, know? we have the best office in the world. Oh my gosh. It's so, so beautiful. We're it needs so to be blessed. Protected <laughs> we are so blessed to do what we do. It's sometimes it's sad because I think people take it for granted. You they know? do. They don't or realize how it. great of fishing we have here. You know, I've guided in Alaska and I've been fishing in lots of places and it's, this is a pretty special place and it needs to be protected more and people need to, you know, pick up some trash on your way out. You right. see it? Pick it up. Michigan is magical. We mm-hmm. need to keep it that way. Yeah. So yeah, back onto the fly. Oh yeah. The miserable magnet. <laughs> So then what I'm going to add it. this is just um, black ice dub. A lot of it. Ooh. A whole bag of it. A whole bag. And this stuff's pretty cool, too. It has kind of the purple hue to it like the um, the chenille did, like we used with the, the wrap of the body. So what I'm going to do here is I get a pretty good clump, maybe about... We could probably do all this. About a Sharpie marker width, I guess you could say. Is it a Sharpie Magnum or a Sharpie? Just oh, regular. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a key step right here. I have a lot of people that ask me, like, how do we... And I'll show you, too, today how to do the... Tonight to do the egg head. But I get this a lot where people are always like, how do you make, you know, those ice dub heads? Whether it's an egg head or a sculpin head and... The key is what you want to do is I'm going to get my thread right here in the middle. And it's almost like the same principle of tying an egg fly, you know, of wrapping yarn to make an egg fly. I'm just going to set this right over the top. And what I'm doing is I'm going to pinch it hard basically around the whole shank with my, my two fingers. And then I'm just going to make a multiple wraps right in the center of it and cinch it down just like that and then all I do is pull there's you're gonna have a lot of access this stuff's so messy like ice dub it's pretty much all over our house all over the dog my daughter's cat used to love to play with all the ice dub and sparkly stuff on my fly tying bench and then what I do is I'm just gonna clip it a little bit Get some of the X fibers off. And then what I do, so you can see I've already made quite a bulk of a head. And then I just take this and I'm just going to pull it all back and tie off in front of it. It's as simple as that. And then I'll kind of flatten it out a little bit, just like, you know, like a goby. It's a lot like a sculpin. Sure. And if you really want to see what they look like, you need to check out Kevin Feenstra's book about the bait fish patterns. It's pretty remarkable, all the underwater footage he did. His book is amazing. Yeah, I mean, just the photos are just incredible. And it'll show you what the stuff looks like. And, yeah, Gobi has, just like a sculpin, a big flat, big round head, kind of a grayish-black tones to it. And you don't want to overcrowd this the schloppen that you tied on the hackle because you want that to have some movement too. You don't want it like, you know, clumped right over it into here. You want that to flutter into the current along with that flash. That looks really good. If I were a fish, I'd eat it. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple, you know, simple guide fly. You could tie a lot of them. Like I said, you can even mix up your colors if you want to do a purple tail or blue. You could do a blue tail even and a black black wrap of those schlopping. And then you just whip finish. So hopefully this helps some of the viewers. And that's the beauty with streamers. I mean, whether you're swinging flies or stripping flies, 
it's just fun because you can be creative and come up with your own stuff. Absolutely. You know? That's that's the whole fun about streamer fishing. You can totally use this in um, like endless color variations. Yeah. Same fly. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. even the way that I did the rabbit actually is a great way for a lot of your trout streamer patterns. You know, like a zonker strip kind of thing. The sure. way I did that, you could you know, if you're tying trout streamers, it's the same same steps yep. basically to take. That looks good. Thanks, Jeff. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. If anybody has questions for Jeff, this is a great time. I'm going to switch the battery out real quick. All right. Switch and, the battery. Uh, we'll uh, tie Take another fly. So why not? I'll put a little background music on even. Why not? Ooh. Why are we? Does anybody have any questions? No. This not is not like everyone's sitting in the front of the class. Great posture. I think everyone's with their I'll Valentine's let, I'll let Brian day. handle questions as we go. So you're one, he's three. Oh, um, so we did have a question. Do you tie this with, uh, you know, barbell eyes? Oops, he's two. Yeah, you, you could tie it with barbell eyes. Sometimes I used to use um, the B-chain eyes. You yep. know, like do the, oh, I don't know if you, I've done it before. And I think, you know, Kevin's done it where we'll do like the, the multiple bead chain eye, like the four. And right, and then you can like cut the, them off. Yeah, and it's kind of a little, makes it even a little heavier, but not. it's not going to drop as hard as like a lead eye. And it's easier to cast, too. It is so much easier to cast. Plus it has, which I don't know if it really makes that much noise, but if you actually take it and shake it, it does have it, that, you know, kind of rattle to it. I'll do with those bead chains. I'll do two or three on either side of the mm -hmm. fly sometimes. And then that way, if I feel like it's too heavy, I can cut it off. But I think it also gives you a little bit um, stronger profile for the head. Yeah, it'll right. Yeah, if you, you do can the bulk up chain. the head because you want to, you know, cover up the bead chain a little bit so your head will be even, you know, bulkier. And sometimes having like sculpin patterns on the swing and even with trout work, well, you know, if you if you do want to make a bigger head because you will get that kickback of that fly when that fly hits the current or comes off the bank, mm -hmm. it'll actually kind of do a little twitch and it'll get their attention especially trout yeah you know like a brown trout sitting up you under get that under reaction cut. bite mm -hmm. gets that how, aggression how was your trout fishing this summer on the pm that was actually pretty good um the hatches weren't you know fabulous but uh like the daytime fishing seemed to be pretty good um i feel like the hatches i don't know what it is um i had a conversation with somebody recently um uh, along the same thing and um it doesn't seem like our hatches are as prolific or as long lasting as they used to be yeah and i don't know if it's um you know indicative of environmental changes you look at like the world's bird population is down like 70 or 80 percent right and i don't know if you noticed this um during the fall but I, I i noticed a lot less migratory birds yeah over the past two to three years mm -hmm. i mean virtually no swans no big flocks of geese no snow geese like the stuff that we'd normally see going through big even flocks of ducks yeah and i don't know if our flyway is switched or if it's um you know indicative of maybe the, the migratory birds aren't moving as far south but i wonder you know, we we always, as guides, worry about fish populations, but I wonder if we should start worrying about insect populations, you know, my, microinvertebrates mm -hmm. uh, in the trout streams. Like a Jenga tower. You, you know, like are we all these different things that we're introducing into the waterways, whether it's PFAS or environmental things that have changed, mm -hmm. what's going on with our, you know, like I can remember brown drakes and, and hexes and stuff like that the big mayflies being just overwhelming sometimes on the upper manistee and now it's it, it doesn't seem to be that way oh, really? as, as much anymore um and i don't know if, are you seeing the same thing i mean this yeah. year we saw a huge um hex or a huge hendrickson hatch really good sulfurs okay but like our isonychias seem to be lacking you huh. know the past past few years so um whether it was the Didymo or what, what are you noticing on the PM with that? Well, I mean, like you said, we used to have awesome caddis hatches. I don't really ever even see that now. I mean, even the Muskegon. Because the used to have, I think that was like think of when we used to fish the Muskegon or the big manistee below Tippy in the yeah, evenings. Like your those, yeah, like tailwaters. I mean, before Buff, you had to wear like 
bandana because right. you would choke on the caddis. And yeah, like you oars, look at your oar. Yeah, your oars just be would just be that. covered, and they would stay there, and, and like you'd mm-hmm. have to power wash them the next day. Your waders would be covered in that, and uh, we really d- definitely don't see that much um, caddis anymore. Yeah, and all our hatches are they're sporadic. I mean, it seems like like even Hex says, you know, in the warmer, you could have two, you know a week of hot weather and then it's like boom and it's done kind right. of thing or it might last a little longer but i don't know i always thought too like and i don't know this is a fact but we get tfm dumped into our river the lamprey right, the lamprey side and it seemed like ever since they started to do that like the the bug life has kind of depleted more because of it but i guess you well, know well we don't have tfm on the upper manistee right. you know and so I don't know if it's necessarily that. I mean, we we def, we we see the effects of TFM in the lower Big Manistee and and mm-hmm. and places like Bear Creek and the Little Manistee and place you know where they have to control the lamp lamprey, right? Which has been amazing. You know, like mm-hmm. the that effort has really paid off. That's good, right? Like we don't see as many lamprey as we used to, or lamprey marks on fish for that matter. Yeah. Yeah, so, I'd agree with that. Even yeah. this king season, I didn't see nearly the amount of lamprey scars. Now, did fish. you guys have a really good king run? Yeah, it was. I mean, I don't think it was as good as probably the last couple years. So I would say. And it say... was kind of the the same thing where we didn't have any rain. We had mm-hmm. low water. They, they kind of came, you know, later, like in September, you know. They weren't, there weren't big numbers of them early on in September. It was more middle towards October. In fact, it was funny because... I had I usually start my steelhead guiding season probably just like you do like towards the end of October, and there was a bunch of bright kings in there. It was crazy. I'm like, man, I should be salmon fishing still because there was just fish everywhere. Right. But right. I I tend to go early on my on my steelhead. If there's one fish out there, I want to try and catch it. So I I start with the first part of October. Yeah. Okay. Um, but. Um, the the king run on the Manistee was massive this year, and it was long. It was oh, it started good. in like middle of August, like it mm-hmm. should have, and then they TFM'd it, and so that kind of messes it up for like ten to fifteen days. Um, but at, even after that, I mean, we're still getting bright kings, like you said, late into mm-hmm. uh, September, early October, we're still hitting bright kings. Um, I'd see a rod bounce, you know, like oh, there's a there's a steelhead, and it's oh. Nice bright king. Yeah. You know? And um, so that's encouraging. And that made me think like, oh, we're going to have a great steelhead run. Because normally if you have a massive amount of kings, uh, that translates into mm-hmm. more more fish, right? And it didn't do that this year, no. unfortunately. So maybe next year. Yeah. Uh, but it's really nice to see the healthy runs of the kings. Yeah, the bigs too. Yeah. Big, big fish. Big fish. Yep. Definitely. Have fun. Looks like Mac got the battery changed out and uh we are i goofed up the frame rate but oh well oh. no one said anything so well, i think we'll it was see what good happens. you know it's the whole thing uh let's see we had hmm, while you're setting up for that jeff do you want to talk about swinging around structure briefly Mm-hmm. as in uh let's see Sometimes it seems like the best option is from downstream casting upstream, which that's a that's a whole thing. I think that'd yeah, be pretty so tough. Basically, like I would say, if if there's a lot of you know snaggy, a lot of wood in an area, especially on the bottom, you don't want to cast too square. You always you know swinging flies. You always, you're swinging a fly. You never want to cast it like on our rivers way upstream because it's just it, one it's going to sink the fly way too quick and that fly is going to have a tendency to kind of tumble, tumble. in the it's current yeah. and um and that's almost like steelhead repellent because it just doesn't look real you know like, steelhead repellent to me, there's, i like that <laughs> there's two things with steelhead repellent that i tell people and that's one of them and then the other bananas? one is huh? bananas is the other oh one. bananas is for sure <laughs> but the other one too is like when so when I swing with clients, I, I do the more traditional approach to swinging where we actually get out and we, you know, walk through the run, just like you would out west or anywhere, you know, like Atlantic Salmon or Steelhead out west or Atlantic Salmon, like Quebec or whatnot. So another Steelhead repellent is, to me, is when 
you cast it out there and you're walking down as it's swinging. Yes. It's not a good thing either because what's happening is your, you know, your fly was nice and had tension on it and it's, you know, fishing straight to the fish, you know, and what will happen is if you start walking that one, if the fish is tracking it, you just, you know, let the current take the fly right by his head and two, it's going to have the same thing. Your, your fly yeah, is going to have a more tendency to tumble into the current. Yeah. And that's, a, you know, there's a lot of keys like that when swinging flies. Like a lot of people think it's just throw it out there and hang on. But you really do have to kind of think about, okay, what's my fly doing in this situation? There's some you know? rules you have to follow. Right. Like so, that's that's one I, I for myself, I, I tell myself, do not walk and fish at the same time. Right. And whether that's nymphing you know whatever it is you know because one you're probably going to trip on something yeah. <laughs> go for a you're swim not paying attention. yeah guaranteed because you're focused on your line or whatever and two just what you're talking about you're you know that fixed point is part of the presentation right. and the, why it works so well i think mm -hmm. do you walk and chew gum at the same time i dare to yes <laughs> 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 Absolutely. You don't fish and walk at the same time. What? Well, I mean, yeah, you know, you during a drift. How about I, that? I know. Keep it's not like I get feet. out of the river every time. But Firm as far as planted, like fishing around structure, yeah, you just like you don't want to fish it too square. Um, a lot of times, I won't mend it. You know, if I know there's wood in there, because I want to keep that the tension on that fly and keep that fly, you know, up in the current more, so it's not getting hung up. Sure. And swinging flies, it's a lot of it too. It's like you'll have scenarios where it's kind of just like somebody um, fishing a plug, like a hot shot in a run, like we see on the big man of steer. Or you'll see, you know, on the PM guys that go plugging. Sometimes when there's a lot of log jams, I think, um, especially if the water's low and clear, like this fall. Sure. We had it happen a couple times where you're actually backing those fish down from like the gut of the run towards the tail out. And you push them so much that they get aggressive. They don't want to, you it's, know, the water's too clear. They don't want to exit that run. Right. And there might be a log jam right there. And then they get stuck like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Fight I can't squeeze flee. under this log. So then they hit the fly. Like I had one scenario this fall with a good friend of mine and a client, Rich, that, you know, he was backing that fly almost down to the log jam. And it was actually a spot where I would say to clients, you know, when I say when, pull it out because there's like root balls and whatnot. And, I mean, he was, like, this close from that log and just got railed by this fish. And I think that's what happened. It was the scenario of that fish probably was sitting more in the middle or something. And he sure. just pushed that fish all the way to the point where he said, you know, and that's what the pluggers. Yeah, yeah. fish that whole run, fish that whole pool, and the end can be mm -hmm. where the magic happens. Yeah. yeah. Do yeah, you like, ever have any success on the PM swinging for kings? Yeah, a little bit. I'd like to actually you know, kind of play around and, and do it more. I just don't have a lot of clients that time of year that would probably want to go do that. But right. um, a client of ours, both of ours, Jim Heck, yeah. actually hooked a same thing. He comes in October, and we were swinging for steel, like I was saying, and then we had so many fresh kings. He got a really big king, and it pulled, like, you know, we chased that thing down. and he I heard just, about yeah, it. Yeah, he couldn't believe it. He was, he was like, psyched. that was intense. I've never caught a king swinging. And that's the thing, like, you know, king salmon, they kind of get a bad rep. But if you actually let those fish bite pound for pound, a king salmon fights really hard. They're, They're a pretty bulldog. Awesome. They don't have the runs of a steelhead, but they are a bulldog. Right. right? Yeah, they'll bulldog you. And I mean, it's a big water fish in a very small yeah. environment. That's the fun of it. It's just an explosion mm -hmm. of power like, i we mean to swing for them in alaska right yeah. and it was fun like you know we'd go down even like as low as the tide water coming in and we'd hook them you know sea lice on them and i mean those things they cranked it i mean those drags were spinning and we'd have the you know back then the kind of spay rods and stuff were just kind of coming on the market like i didn't even know what a spay rod was and i'd have like english guys you know on the sure. boat and they'd have those big 13 14 foot spay rods and i mean those things were buckled like to the point where get in the boat we gotta go chase this thing <laughs> i love it yeah it's kind of they're a cool fish and if i had you know king season i'm so busy you know fishing day to day but if i definitely had somebody that i could talk into you know hey you want to swing all day and see if we can get one of these and i've gotten them doing it 
you know, like personally going out and doing it. And we've gotten them stripping too, which I'm sure you've done. Well, I know Walt has a fly that he swears by for swinging for kings. And I've done it with kids where you can swing like over the reds. With oh, the, yeah. With the salmon, like with a big flashy fly and those mm-hmm. males in the back. Oh, will yeah. Eat it, right? So you take like, I love to take like, you know, 12, 15 year old, you know, like kids mm-hmm. and, and put a sinking line on and swing those those big flies and they crush it. Oh, they yeah. eat it. Like it, they, yeah. those males just can't resist something like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of visual too Mm -hmm. for them and it's totally legit. Like, you know, you're not like targeting female, you know, whatever, but you're fishing to those, those aggressive males that are fighting for that spawning position. And it's pretty darn exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without question. That's my favorite thing about salmon season. Like my salmon clientele, a lot of them aren't my steelhead and trout clientele. And a lot of it's, you know, couples and kids and families. Like I even for years I've taken out you know, a husband and wife and their son, and we just have fun. It's yeah. just great. It's a great fish for kids, and it's a to get them into the sport. They can see them, you right. know, like you said, the visual of it, yeah. and it's usually warmer, nicer weather, and, you know, even for spouses, you know, it's just a, it's a great fish to get people into river fishing. It is a fishing. great fish to get in. And like we talked about earlier, you know, people just take a lot of that stuff for granted, and, and they'll bite. Right. If you let they them bite, bite. They will bite. If you let eat. them bite, they will eat. There is no doubt you know, about it. They're they're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fun. Yeah. Like a lot of us guys. I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for salmon fishing. Well, I don't you think know? our population of steelhead would be where it is without. Right. No, it's salmon. a big. I mean, it plays a big part of it. It, it does. does. Yeah. If we didn't have all this, the I mean, think of the protein. Yeah, it's not just a standalone the, thing. I mean, trout. it plays into oh, it my big gosh. time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we catch. You know, so many trout in the fall, like, we'll go egging for them and stuff, which is so fun. And, yeah, you get them in, and you're just like, why did this even eat my egg fly? He's just, like, gurgitating, you know, <laughs> real salmon eggs. And you're just like, this is incredible. And his belly's just like a giant Distended. football. But it holds them over, you know, it gets them through their spawn, especially the right. browns in the fall, and holds them over through the winter. Yeah, absolutely. It's the a super important source. part of our, uh, you know, life cycle here. Mm-hmm. So what are we tying next? So... This fly I call the luscious leech. This has been in my box. This is since a classic. Day this one. Is. Yes. So I've probably been fishing this fly for yeah twenty years or so. I've actually the first steelhead that I caught swinging on the you know actually swinging swinging. I caught steelhead you know swinging flies by accident kind of thing. But this was like the first fly I actually caught my first fish swinging on. So worth keeping in your box. Yeah, I still use it. Yeah. To this day, and especially this fall, low clear water. It's a great low clear water fly. It has tons of movement. As you can see, I I wrap wood duck flank in it, just wrap it, no flash. Um, I keep it pretty simple and more natural with the, the shrimp ice dub. Um, but it's same thing. You could, I've tied in olive, caught fish with it, olive rabbit. You know, you can mix it up. If the water's stained more, you can do, you know, chartreuse head dark orange head simple so, changes yeah right it's just a simple fly i tie it on a daiichi the 2461 number one and if i wanted to make it smaller like this fall downsizing stuff i would just tie it on the same hook but a number two a little bit smaller profile um but yeah it's just a really easy fly and it does look really cool in the water it has a lot of movement to it and you know, just flutters in the current having that rabbit. And then you'll see how I wrap the, the flank feather in between the rabbit. And it just kind of really gets a lot of movement as the current's hitting it. What are the advantages, I mean, for the first time viewers of this, of the 2461? Um, the hook. The hook. The hook. Yeah. Cause um, I've used them for years. Uh, I know Kevin has used them too. I love using them on the PM because, one... They're a very sharp hook, but they're a light wire. And a lot of times if you do get caught on the bottom, like we don't have a lot of rock on the PM, but you'll get caught, you know, in the dirt or on the sand or a a log. If you don't set the hook hard enough on it, you can roll cast it off and you can bend it back. Right. Pliers. It's it's a tough hook, but it's a little lighter wire, so you can bend it back. But the biggest thing I use, you know, a lot of the iron type hooks still is because we're throwing you know, casting a lot under trees, you know, it's the, the pre really technical, you yep. know, you're making, 
like you can do spade casts. We do a lot of snap T casts, but a lot of it's just roll casting. And you know, you're not stopping your rod up here to launch it. You're bringing your rod all the way to the water and almost sometimes skipping the fly under a tree right. just to get it in there. Right. So having a shank fly can sometimes hurt you having the you know shank with the trailer hook because it hits the tree and gets wrapped around and you can't get it back. You're you know you're gonna have to float over there and try to trash the whole climb up the tree to get your fly back. <laughs> where these are a little easier. I use the same hook with. quite a bit because it can bend out. You can. Yeah. We bend it a couple times and still land a fish on it. Yeah, it's still good, and yeah. they're super sharp. They are very, very sharp. sharp. So yeah, I use this hook a lot. It's just the size one. They make a one knot too, they which do. is a lot yeah. bigger. It's a jump. Bend. It is yeah. a big jump in yeah. that particular model. So it's a, it's a great hook for the bad good. hair day. Yeah, yeah, or like bass flies, it would yep. be good for. But th you, that's one thing you don't want to mix it up. So this is just a number one, basically. We had a question. Do you ever tie any of these flies on tubes? Yeah, sometimes. Um, I think everybody, you get into swinging flies for steelhead, and we kind of go through a tube fly phase. And I've done that for a while, but same thing. It just takes longer to, to make them, and um, they look good. They um, do look good. Yeah, I mean, when they're in the water, you know, you got everything's profiled perfect, you know, tying it around a tube. But, yeah, it just... The time thing of it, the time frame. <laughs> It'll yeah. certainly save you on hooks. Yeah. Because you can yes. have a huge box of flies and one pack of hooks. Mm -hmm. Or you can have, I used to carry a little box that had, you know, the magnet compartments. And I could have two or three or six different types of hooks for different flies. And they work. They work. It's it's fun. Everyone should try tying tubes mm -hmm. just to, no, it is to play with it. You could tie any of these flies that Jeff's doing to on tubes. If you prefer to do it that way, yeah. for yeah. sure. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I know uh, one of our mutual friends that did the Skagit Master, Jade Niederstadt, he loved to tie in tubes. And he would tie tubes where, I mean, like he would add, he'd have a little tube and he would add like different colors and like basically build he your would, whole fly right on you your can leader. Get, it was incredible. I just talked to Jay for like an hour oh, and a half this week. And, Great guy. Uh, yeah, I'm, he's trying to sell me a condo in his little complex. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, hi, he's, Brian. He's in Do I have a pitch for yeah. you? <laughs> like, and I'm like, man, that sounds really good, Jay. Like, I'm going to fly out there and see him. Like, so I, I think I might try and fly out there and see him and go fishing this winter. I don't know. That'd be cool. Yeah. If you do, tell him I said hi. Yeah. He was always fun to fish with. Jay is the best. Yeah. He was great. He stopped in the shop, yeah, was it last shop? summer no. or the summer before? Last summer. He kind yeah. of surprised us, didn't he? He, did. he just came in and we happened to both be. <laughs> he is. Just, like, oh. He is. He and Tom and was I, awesome. Man, you know, he just the, yeah, he was a great the guy. three amigos. The three amigos for sure. And, and uh, man, he used to fish the little man Steve like crazy. Yeah. He knew every like inch of that. Mm -hmm. uh, he would fish it on his lunch hour and when he worked for the Forest Service. And yep. uh, yeah, so yeah, he's good dude for fishy, sure. Fishy dude too. Super fishy. The fishiest guy, uh, maybe like between he and Ross. I don't know. It's pretty tough to. I mean, but he'd be like, "Hey Pitts, try this fly." today and he he's yeah. like i tied up a dozen this morning with like three cups of, you know three pots of coffee <laughs> and you know he, he was just like yep and then i'd try that fly and it would just be on fire mm -hmm. <laughs> it was like it was amazing like, how'd you yeah. come up with this so fast yeah. i don't know i was just thinking about it but then and you talk about a guide fly if his flies took more than two minutes to tie he didn't yeah. tie it yeah <laughs> like that was it Yep. Lash yeah, some stuff tied, onto the hook. He had tied tubes even, and I've done it with, uh, remember the old hollow Q-tips? Yep. Yeah, yep. we've just tied tubes with those. He I would, tried that. They're so, I mean, you have to have just the right tension, otherwise you yeah, compress them too much. Compress them and then they... He yeah. would tie them in his boat sometimes. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, he is insane. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. Uh, perfect. All right. So this fly, too, is um, we're going to eat... Use the rabbit. So we're going to make, like I did on the shank, you know, multiple thread wraps. Get that hook covered pretty good. Just starting from the eye again and working to the back. Because we don't want that rabbit to spin on us as we cinch it down. 
While you're tying this, Jeff, can you tell us kind of what your line setup is on the PM? So, um, a lot of times I'm using switch rods, and I'll use a Skagit, compact Skagit, or like the Scout heads. Mm -hmm. I like too. Um, the shorter heads are a little bit easier to cast in situations where you want to get it under trees and stuff. The problem is, is if they're too short and you're into that running line, it's going to be harder to roll cast your fly off a log. If you caught like the backside of a log, you just don't have enough, you know, no, that, I mean that, fly line. That scout head's so short. Yeah. So you risk it. I like just basically the compact skagits. Um, usually grain wise, I'm using, you know, 11, 8. I love the my one of my favorite client rods is the Echo Swing. It's that's an eleven eight eight rod. weight, and that's a great rod. It, I mean, you, it's so versatile. It's you can even I fished it out of the boat even on the Muskegon. It's just a great little rod, and I'll usually run like a four eighty mm -hmm. head on that or a four fifty. I kind of always go with like for the PM like when we were talking about the buckets. You know, in the depth, I, I try to go line size. Like if you look at, you know, your rod and it has a line recommendation, I kind of go to the the smaller number and not the higher number. Because the higher you get into that line, that means thicker in diameter, and especially a floating line, then you're going back to that scenario of you're more buoyant, you know. So like if it says like, let's say 480 to 550, I'm going to go more to the 480 range or the 510 range and not the high 550 because it's just going to be too buoyant. I do the to same. To not get the fly down quick enough. I do the same because we're running, you know, anywhere from what, you know, 8 to 12 feet of T line. Right, off T14. The end of that, right. Yep. You know, yep. so I do the same thing. So, yeah, that's basically my setup. And then for leaders, same thing. I think we've talked about it before. I don't run a super short, like two foot leader like you might see out you know west and whatnot usually i run my leaders about f four feet to five feet because of the same principle when you're fishing those buckets i want a little longer lead to to drop that fly quicker if it you know hits and you have a short leader you're gonna have too much tension on it and the current could pull it up you know like the hydraulics or whatnot especially if you know the current might be faster on top of the surface compared to the bottom and it's just going to draw it up you know, so I'll use a little longer leader just to sink it. And for tippet size, I usually 12 fluoro or 15 fluorocarbon. Yep. Like this year when I started running some smaller flies because of the super gin clear water, I was going down to 10. But most most of the time I would say it's 12. I'm 12 to 15. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you run um, – I'm always curious about this because – you know, I, I tend to run straight 12, but then sometimes I'll run a short stint of like 20 pound off of there. Yeah, I do that a lot, like a little And then butt. I'll run, you know, maybe two feet of that, and then I might run a, a micro swivel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, attach my 12 pound to that mm -hmm. or my 15 pound to that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes, like, when the water's long, you know, we keep going back to the fall being low and clear, but even a swivel... You know, it's going it to give you a little, a little bit, bit of weight, too. It does. Yep. yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that definitely works. Sorry I keep asking all these questions and get you to No, questions here. are good. I like answering questions. And they might not all be right. It's just over the years kind of what I've done. I think as fishermen, we all, you know, you get stuck in your rut, and this is what works. And oh, you ask 10 people, it. you get at least 10 answers, right? Yeah, I mean, right. everyone's going to have their own thing that gives them confidence for uh -huh. sure. So. So, yeah, basically kind of just like the shank, I'm going to tie. This is just a regular, it's the same stuff, the hairline, black rabbit strip. It's not cross cut. And I'm going to measure it, the length of the shank of the hook, because you don't really want to make this long at all because that will twist around the bend of the hook and they will sometimes casting. short strike that exactly so i just kind of take it like this and i just bring it back and just kind of like that last fly i'll just kind of pull it apart a little bit and just tie in between it and same thing just quite a few wraps and give it a good cinch with your heavy thread 
and that's it. This one's kind of crooked, so I'm going to take it. Just You can see how it... Oh, there it goes. The tip was kind of crooked. Hairline. <laughs> there. So yeah, then what we're going to do is I'm going to take my thread and kind of move it right towards the middle of the shank, like so. Then I'm going to take this rabbit and I'm palmering it towards my thread. I'm just kind of, you want to cinch it too, wrap it tight because sometimes you might, if you don't wrap it tight enough and when you go to tie it off, it could spring on you and just open right up. So that's the same thing about, like I said, about having a lot of thread wrap on your, on your hook shank or your hook. And all these steps, it's the same stuff like everyone who's watching today can take with you for tying trout flies, any type of stuff like that. So that's what I did. I just tied it off in the middle. And then we're going to take a cool wood duck flank feather, which I have lots of great friends that like to duck hunt. My buddy Cole is a big duck hunter, and he supplies me with lots of feathers and wings. It's, nice. it's the best to have buddies and customers that will bring you feathers. Uh, I've, I've been spoiled a few times with folks bringing me feathers. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get Melvin I, to bring us feathers. You even mailed me some feathers, yes, which I was did. fantastic. Yeah, I have lots. I love tying with mallard and wood duck, like filling feathers like this, because they just have so much movement. They look pretty. And they're so webby. Yep. They give such great contrast when you're using darker colors. It's just, it makes it, Hold that it breaks everything up. up. Um, put it right by the fly. Switch those cameras like that looks good. I mean, you get a really nice quality piece like that. Right. It, the results are going to, they're going to, you know, be noticeable. Definitely yeah, going to catch had, more fish with yeah, that. For sure. No doubt. You're going to have confidence. One of my friends, Wayne, he's a big duck hunter, and I've actually gotten to my truck at the end of the day, and there's been like a mire bag hanging from my <laughs> mirror, mirror full of duck feathers. I'm like, that's awesome. Wayne Anderson? Yep. Wayne yeah. That's Anderson. hilarious. <laughs> you got I it. I love it. Yep. I've had a, hey, all, Wayne, how you doing? Cole's I've a had big a, duck hunter, too. He's yeah. helped me out with a lot of feathers. I've had Dan stops by, and he's like, yep, I shot some birds this morning. Come on out to the truck. And he's just, he's like, yeah, just pull what you want. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Okay. Langman, anytime it's Langman awesome. sees them, yep. he's constantly oh, putting them in bags <laughs> when they go on their duck hunting stuff, yep. safaris out west and stuff. It's so awesome. So yeah, what I wanted, I want to find, so I've wrapped everything this way. So when I tie this on, I don't want to wrap it the opposite way because it's got a pretty thick stem and it will, just like I said with the rabbit, it'll kind of want to open up, which it'll even do doing it this way. But what I do is because I've wrapped, you know, I want to wrap this the same way as I wrap the rabbit. So I'll find a feather where you can see the fibers are longer on one side than the other. And this particular one, like if I'm looking at it, it'd be the left side. And this is the dull part of the feather, the bottom part. So you got your left side, and then this is the dull part. Right here, the feather, that's the bottom. You can kind of see like the feather's always going to have kind of a, a flex to it there. So what I'm going to do, because I want these long fibers, that's the, the juicy stuff that's going to move a lot in the current. I'm going to take this side and just lightly pull that all off. Like so. Man. Oh, so you strip one side. Makes wrapping. I mean, it orients the feathers super easy. I'm sure when you're working with it. Yeah. So then, what I do is I'm going to take this and just hold it back. And like I said, I'm tying it from the tip. Just like so. And I'm going to cut that. Now comes. This is a little harder just because you got to. 
you know, a key thing to do right here is sometimes too, just to hold it back to do your thread, like a close pin or something, you know, to clamp. So you're sure. not getting all that material. So then I'm going to make some thread wrap, but I don't want to go close to the eye because I'm going to put that egg head on too. So I'm going to just kind of stop it about here, kind of a quarter of a way from the eye. Leave plenty of room for the head. Yep. And then I'm going to wrap the rest of this rabbit, which is usually just a couple wraps. Same thing, pulling it tight. So this is basically like a, you know, three material pattern. Yeah, that's it. Wow. Push this back a little bit. And that's one thing you guys, anybody when you're tying flies, like if you think you're going to be too balked in the head, just nice and easy take your, your, you know, your pointer finger and your thumb and just pinch it and just kind of smoosh it back a little bit and then make your thread wrap. So yeah, now I'm gonna take the wood duck and I'm just going in between the rabbit oh. and just working it to the front. Just like that. That looks so good. You know, the tips of those almost kind of look like they kind of have that jungle cock look yeah. to them, like a very traditional... Because of the barring. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and then I'm going to make a lot of wrap. And, like, at this point, it looks goofy, but then I'm going to show you guys how you can fix that. So I'm pulling it all back. And then I'm going to separate this stuff a little bit because it's, you know, pretty thick. But look at all the webs I get out of that. That just looks by super it apart. webby. So, yeah, in the current, that's just going to... And then with the rabbit kicking around. The whole intruder idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those are nice, long, webby feathers. Then I'm just going to add a collar in front of that just to... Make it look a little prettier so it's not all of just black shopping. Nice. So I'm just going to get same thing like a nice, you know, thicker piece, which has a little bit longer feather fiber to it. So and again, this is it. one of those patterns. You could tie this in purple, olive. Yeah. Olive, it works tan. good. Olive works I've good. caught fish like a sunny day, low clear water situation. Tie it smaller with olive, the peach head. And then I'm just like the schlopping before with the soft hackle. I'm just going to take the hackle and tie it in by the tip. So, Jeff, when you mentioned the head colors as you're tying along here, um, what? So, you, you talked about a peach head for this one. Mm hmm. And um, so, would you, like, I, I would mix up my colors so i might run orange peach yeah you could do uh, that chartreuse whatever based on so how do you how do you how do you decide like on the color of the water color of the water what about the color of the sky so if it's a clear sunny day out and you have clear water what color head do you typically choose i would do the peach or a, a, an orange mm -hmm. maybe a darker orange and like an overcast day you might pick a chartreuse chartreuse yep or like a um, a hot or a pink a pink mm -hmm. yep yep yeah I kind of even with egg flies like if you read my fishing report a lot on my website you'll I always kind of put like a hint of what color you know eggs are working and a lot of it's based on to me I kind of switch it up a lot based on the water clarity you know yeah. if the water's got a nice heavy stain to it then a chartreuse or like you said like a bright pink. Something like that with that contrast is going to work really well. So, yeah, you, I probably, you know, with flies in general, all the flies I tie, I base a lot of it more on, you know, the water scenario, like I said, and where I'm fishing. Sure. You know. Water and light conditions. I don't get too technical into the fly itself. Yeah. It's just more about 
you know, well, I want to tie this for this kind of water scenario or this for this particular pool, you know. It makes sense. Thank you for that insight. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm just going to plumber this towards the eye, kind of like we did that last fly with the blue. And the same thing, like you don't even need to put an egg head on this. If you were fishing some super clear water or low water too, this actually would work Yeah, that'd well. be perfect. Like usually with egg sucking leeches, you know, they're kind of like a, a hot spot. It's like that attractor to get, you know, hopefully to get more of an aggression aggressive mm-hmm. response out of the fish just that little bit of color is there that fine line i felt like this fall for me um between a hot spot and a scary spot like i, I was scare just, the fish like i was trying to is, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah exactly like, i was trying to figure out how to word that right? that's that's a good way to but put it but it's like yeah. oh is this a hot spot or is this going to be like a scary is spot right? too much like, is it oh too no much? i'm leaving yeah there i go like see you later <laughs> dude that wasn't even close you're the alien that abducted me like three days ago. <laughs> so, yeah, you could fish this. I mean, that's pretty cool looking like space. That fly. is a like really a cool spay. looking. Yeah, yeah, like a bunny spay. Yep. For sure. Mm-hmm. Before you yep. do the head, we did have a question from Eric. Uh, he was curious about um, difference in depths when you're swinging flies and strikes. So do you prefer running deeper in the water column or shallower in particular situations, basically. So let's just, we'll, awesome we'll refine question. that down yeah. to, you know, where do you see the most amount of action in terms of water depth, I would say. And that's a great question. Yeah, it, it's a really it actually, good question. A lot of it depends on the year and the, the water temperature. Okay. So early in the fall, probably most of the hits, you know, the, the fish are suspended more. Like we were talking about earlier, fall fish, when the water's warm, they're moving more. They're not on the bottom. And I think that's where a lot of people in Michigan, because of the old adage of, you know, let's chuck and duck to sure. catch our fish. Um, you can almost be fishing under the fish. Yes. Because the fish are more up here and they're moving a lot, especially if the water conditions are perfect where, you know, it's high, it's got a stain to it. And those fish are chrome. So, yeah, you don't want to be down bottom. So I'll get most of my action, you know, that time of year will be pretty much like could be at the top of the run with like the first cast or two before it even is getting down they you know move. or the yeah. same with like in the tail out of a run like if the water's high well you know i mean by then you're like maybe three feet of water at most on the pm wow. yeah you know like a tail out there's not much water there anyways and you're not even close to the bottom by then because you're th- like i said before with the the question about the fishing structure and stuff we're not fishing square at that point we're way down you know and letting it swing so we're not mending it or letting it get caught on the bottom so yeah that's a great a great question and then as winter progresses you know, when the water gets colder, that's when those fish will start to be on the bottom more. And that's where you're going to, like, your intermediate head will come into play more because it's going to, you know, sink the fly faster and fish it slower. And that's where adding weight in, you know, certain scenarios where you might have a lot of current in a deeper hole, you know, you're going to want to add weight and get that fly down in front of the fish more. Yeah. And that's where you'll find, like... And that scenario, too, is when you get, like I talked about earlier, where steelhead will give you in the winter, it's more of a, sometimes it can be a more of a, a pull, pull, pull kind of scenario. And that's what's so hard for a lot of people because we're all taught, you know, in Michigan, set, you feel set. the bite, you go like this, <laughs> but you got to have a lot of patience and, you know, let that fish basically choke on the fly. Right. Because you'll feel it pull, pull, pull. And that's usually what it is. That fish is more on the bottom. And, you know, just like us, the colder it gets out, we don't want to go do a lot of things. You know, we want right. to sit home and tie flies by the wood stove and be lazy. And right. those fish good. get the same way. Yeah. You know, yeah. you got to coax them at some times to bite. And that's where a lot of your hits are going to be more on the bottom in the winter months. Well, I think you made a good point. And it's a point I've heard from a lot of really, really good anglers is it's this reminder that a lot of the the fish we're fishing to are programmed to come up, up. for food. Yeah. 
up for food. I've heard that from people fishing trout in Pennsylvania. I've heard it out west. I've heard it here where, you know, start higher and then work down. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're looking for some sort of progression, I think that's the way to yep. go because give fish, especially in ideal water temp conditions and ideal, you know, water clarity conditions, give them the opportunity to come up and get it. And it's right. a lot of fun. So, yeah, cool. That was a great question from uh, question. from Eric. Thanks, Eric. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that was a great question. All right, so you're gonna add some peach to this? Yeah, yep, just some ice stub. We're gonna make an egg head, like we talked about, kind of the little hot spot. And just like we did with the the miserable magnet with the black head, we're just going to basically, you know, get a thick piece again, big chunk of it. You need like the we need to make flip down readers. Do you remember those from like the the sunglasses? From the baseball players in the like baseball. the early nineties, the flip downs. Cap. Yeah, <laughs> who's the guy from? Uh, who's the guy from Parks and Recreation? That oh yeah, he always had those in the ads or whatever. Where do you have the flip yeah. downs? I don't remember I don't that know. one. I don't know. So yeah, then same thing. I'm gonna get my thread kind in the middle, and then you get the flip down shades when you're in. Put it right field. over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Catch the ball, right? Try to cinch it so it's all the way around it. And then just pull tight, do a few wraps. And then just kind of, you can trim it to whatever you want. If you want it big and bulky so you get more movement, you can, you know, make it a big egg head. I'm just going to trim it a little bit to give it kind of more of a profile with the, the body of the fly. Oh, that looks good. Is this, and this is kind of your default. Like if you're going to tie one color of this, would you do it with this, with this orange? Yeah. This or like the just regular ice tub orange. I think it's, is it like steel orange hotter. or something? It's orange. And yeah. this is to be uh, specific. This is uh, what uh, I'm trying to remember. I the think color. it's called like shell. Yep. Shell pink. pink I don't know if it's, I don't think we'll it's have pink. To check. It's like shrimp. It's shrimp. shrimp. That's what it is. It's shrimp. Their their colors are a little bit different. Because shell is much more pink. Yeah, it's like actual more pink hue to it. And I'll put a I will put a materials list up for everyone watching. Thanks, Matt. Oh so, yeah. Pretty simple, but really effective. It looks great, Jeff. I mean, it seems like the trick to get that dense bulk head is start with more than you're going to end yeah. up with you have more to be willing better yeah you have to be willing to to burn a little bit to get that shorter dense head it's kind of the same principle as you know tying the egg fly mm -hmm. the more yarn you have the more you're going to get that circle when you put tension on it and cut right. it right or the less yarn it's going to even if good. it feels too much right because you can always you can always trim it back right exactly absolutely well, there you go. The luscious leech. It's such Love a staple it. in my box. I actually had Matt Sudwig make me an awesome sticker for my it's awesome. new stealth craft right on the bow. Oh, really? No it's way. part of my logo. <laughs> yeah, That's super cool. We just had him do a custom t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we yeah. can't wait to He's release so it. Yeah. Yeah. The, drop, it. The, drop the drop is, is coming this spring. It's yeah. going to be good. So We're super excited <laughs> about that. Zudwig's he a does great some artist. great stuff. Yeah, so. very and, uh, talented. Very, very good guide on the Muskegon as well. Yes. So. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. Do you have anything you want to add? No, just thanks to everybody who viewed in. and Yeah. I, and we for having me. Really, a, you know, for it being Valentine's Day. We really had uh, a great turnout, it looks like. Yeah. And, uh, we, at one point, we had over sorry. 100 people tuned in, which is great. Oh, that's so. awesome. Oh, yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah. sorry it took us this long to everyone to get every the production down for this uh, for this this winter's fly time. But we've been bu it's worth very it. busy. It's uh, worth the wait. And, and it is totally worth the wait. And Jeff, always, it's so much fun to have you. Thanks. And, Thanks for um, having me. You know, we, we look forward to... You know, the time we get all go fun fishing together. I know. Like and I, I, I think earlier. we were brainstorming earlier, and I think that uh, we, we need to do something where we 
tie a fly, and then we go fish it. Yeah. I, I think that we need to make this happen. So kind of like I, a one-fly tournament. We each can make our own fly, ooh, and then we'll take a video to see whoa. who can catch the fish on it. Oh, I like that. So One-fly. I, I, I could be in for a one-fly. One this could be a really fun summer thing for us to do, Matt. Yeah, we'll yeah, do some trout let's do fishing. That. I'm All sold. Right. All right, let's do it. Can we? F- can m- Can different people fish the same fly? Ooh, like you or think can you, you can not fish repeat Jeff's fly better? Well, no, that would be I just cool. want to know if anyone yeah, else like is going to develop a fly and then <laughs> and then somebody, somebody else, else has to fish it. it. It's like a white elephant out. gift. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I think the world is. You guys might be onto that. something. You might. Yeah. Let's Turn this it. into your own Northern Angler tournament. <laughs> I Never like know it. what happens. Never know. know. You could put like a bunch of flies in a hat, and each person has to pick that fly out, and that's Ooh. they got to figure it out. Like have every contestant tie a fly and put them all in a hat, and then they have to pick. Ooh, that'd be kind of a cool that would be fly a tournament. Really, I think I think you're on something there, Jeff. Anyway. I really appreciate you coming out. Thanks. Thanks coming for having me. Yeah, we it's always love having you here. Love it's having you here. You're so professional. A lot of knowledge. And, uh, we're, we're happy to have you I as try. our first uh, you know, live fly town event for the year. And guess what, Matt? Like you, like you put this all together, and it was you know went really well, smoothly. I didn't have yeah, to. Power I wasn't out. sweating beforehand. I like the green room thing. So you the could green room. Me, yeah, if you missed it, you missed uh, it Brian we went live. A, uh, we're going to do that. We're going to do that where Brian goes live on Instagram before we go live. It's like live on live. Why it's not? live so. on live because Matt doesn't like me stressing out before. Gives him something to do. I, it does. So <laughs> it worked out fine. You know, when he's doing the AV setup, TV yeah, it's good. thing, and, and you get to see it all. And so thanks a lot, Matt, for all your efforts with this. Uh, you rock. Big, this. big thanks to to our buddy Justin who lent us an extra Ooh. camera for this. Thanks Justin. Uh, if Justin you're watching. Yeah. Big big thanks buddy. Uh uh kind of made things work and made made Jeff look really good. Yeah. So. It looks That's amazing. Good. You yeah. need yeah. a lot of lighting and camera for that one. You were a little worried when I had that light cranked up oh, yeah. <laughs> to like, 100. Oh my gosh, you could bring the airplanes uh. down in the parking lot. All right. I hope not. But yeah, if anybody too has any questions they can, you know, email me. My uh, email's on my website, outfittersnorth.com. Um, you could find me on Instagram at Jeff Hubbard PM River Guide. I got pretty cool photos. And uh, everything from fishing to hunting fish. to biking. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so. hopefully a YouTube, some more YouTube yeah. stuff soon. Yeah, yeah. something so that we're working stay on. Stay tuned for that. We kind of started kind of, you know, brainwashing when it was so cold a month ago. Like, well, I might as well start tying some flies and doing something with it. Oh, well, it's yeah. better so, than going out and, on your dirt bike or snowmobile and hurting yourself. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, I've done that plenty of times. <laughs> no fresh pins this yeah. time. No, Thank goodness. No broken bones yet yeah. this year. But dirt bike season is just around the corner. Oh, man. I'm already itching. That's I, the thing with it. Like, it hurts you, but you just, once you do it, you just want to go do it. It just gets in your blood. <laughs> right? It's just like fishing and hunting. That's right. Mountain biking to dirt biking, it just it gets in your blood. Good for you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. We Thank really you. appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we hope you have a great winter and hope you have a great spring. Yeah, and you too. We look forward to the next time we get to do this together. Yeah. You guys too. Hopefully we'll get some water in the river. I hope so. 